wanted to roll into this with, uh, I guess, the most relevant thing I could that could possibly be happening um, right now. And sadly, it's, it's not John's beard, but it is a. Uh, I would probably say the the possible beginnings of an of a world war. Would you agree to that? Uh, I mean, or is that an overstatement? I largely think that's like an overstatement. I mean, I, first of all, like, I'd say like, you know, for it to be a world war has to be on, you know, multiple continents. So right now we're just on Europe. And I guess a more serious thing is, I think, uh, obviously like the State of Unions tonight. So uh, Joe Biden, you know, will address and the administration, you know, will address and say what, probably say like what their specific plans are. But I'd say kind of largely, I think they made it pretty clear, both him, so the US and like, what is like NATO, they've made it clear that like, they won't, there's a limit to how much they'll be invested in like Ukraine. And so they've said, you know, we'll give weapons, certain countries have made like, talks about like allowing like people, like international volunteers to go and fight on their own. But they've said like, you know, we won't give us, I think there's, there's a big issue with like Polish fighter jets recently. And so like they said, you know, there's a limitation of how much we'll give and no troops have been deployed. I think it was right before this, like before the war broke out fully, like the Russian invasion, I should say. So I've, you know, the war has been going on in that country for eight years or so since 2014. Like kind of before that, you know, there was a talk of, I think they were drawing down troops. Kind of like, it was like two weeks ago, they were like drawing down, you know, troops that were close, like all the troops that were kind of advisors in Ukraine got pulled out and kind of they were drawing down like ones that were like in Poland or Romania. So I'd, I'd say, I think it's somewhat of a miscalcul or I, I think it's somewhat overblown to say like it's a world war, but I, I've, I've seen, you know, things can change. You know, it's, it's mm. been a little less than a week since the invasion started. So, you know, things can go a lot more than what we planned. So what is the, um, you know, the, the U.S. and I would even say a lot of Western Europe or any country really has just left Ukraine. <laughs> like just, you know, we give them a little bit. We put a little sanctions on the old Russia. We give them a little bit of weapons, but we're like, this ain't our shit yet, man. Like, what is that? Why is Ukraine dispensable? I mean, I honestly say it's it's main thing. Like you could say is like, it's just Russia has nuclear weapons, you know, at the end of the day. And like, I think, you know, the, the past, you know, conflicts the U.S. has been in, you know, they've been with non-nuclear states, you know, Iraq, uh, that was, you know, new, non-nuclear armed state, you know, um, I guess both Iraqs, Afghanistan, non-nuclear armed state, you know, intervention in like Somalia, you know, no nuclear weapons, Grenada, Panama, no nuclear weapons. So like, it, it really is just, you know, Russia is obviously, it's a massive country and a massive military and, and they have nuclear weapons. And at the end of the day, you know, that that's sort of like the line of like, it's kind of, just the nuclear weapons at the end, you know, nobody, we've gone to the brink, I guess, multiple times during the Cold War, like people, that, that's kind of the line, that one line people are not willing to cross is, yeah, the nuclear weapons kind of, so like, yeah, they'll say, you know, give weapons to Ukraine and all that stuff, but kind of at the end of the day, they won't do direct damage, just I'd say because of nuclear weapons. I, it's been shocking to see, um, you know, I mean, obviously, it seems to be common sense to that nuclear war is the absolute like would be the end of humanity as we know it, right? And yeah. and would cause incredible repercussions. But just to see that Putin has just been flexing it the past, you know, forty eight hours or so is 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 very, <laughs> it's very scary. It's like yeah. been in the back of my mind. You know how on. The first Tuesday of the month, we have uh, the the sirens go off. They did that today. Yeah, right. Yeah. Now. And, and yeah, dude, the yeah, sirens yeah. started going. And I was like, no, is it what? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, the news. And then I was like, oh, it's 10 o'clock on Tuesday. On the yeah. first Tuesday. And then I was like, oh, I was like, holy shit, bro. <laughs> like, I didn't They sent an email, like, always for us. And they're like, you know, we, you know, I said there was like, you know, we have regulars. But yeah, today I feel like. <laughs> They were really kind of extra, kind of important to send out that email. Be like, yeah, this is just a warning. <laughs> we are not getting bombed by Russia yet. Um, so I don't know. It's 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 hard to tell um what that's coming out of this conflict is truth. 
I'm just mm-hmm. curious, um, since you are well scholared in this, um, in, in sort of like pol- foreign relations and politics, how, how do you how do you even get this information? How do you get the information in today's world? I mean, it's honestly just a lot of it is like you have to take the time to like just look through stuff and kind of, you know, be critical of yourself. Like, I think, I think obviously like a regular person can like, like even without like kind of all the stuff they can, like just if they take the time, like kind of be critical of stuff, you know, uh, go into like who's like posting things or like what's the source of this video and stuff like that, or just kind of like ask other people. Like I say like, obviously like thing thing that kind of helps me out is, you know, like I have professors that I ask, you know, about who are a lot more, you know, experience in this stuff, you know, who know stuff and no colleagues overseas or in specific positions, you know, so like I, I'll ask them, you know, like, you know, what's true, what's not. So I've got that resource, I'd say, but, you know, it's really is just kind of being a lot more like critical and kind of skeptical about stuff. And yeah, just kind of going, doing a lot more like, I guess, research that is, uh, um, I, cause I don't want to like sound like those people who are like, you know, oh, I do my own research or something like that. But, like, <laughs> Cause like that, that's, you know, that's usually just like some person, like, you know, you look up like a Wikipedia article or like, you know, you read like one paper or like half paper, or half an article. It, it is really like something that takes time. And like, uh, it's something you have to, I guess, hone or something like that. But yeah, you know, it's, it's honestly just like asking around, like trusted people and stuff like that. So like, this is something that Keeping I kind of, critical, yeah, kind of just don't allow yourself to kind of like be trapped in like specific narratives or something like that. Yes, that's huge. Like going in with a specific narrative you're looking for changes yeah. all of the searches that you could possibly make. But yeah. the kind of a fundamental struggle I've just been having as of recent, especially, I mean, it's hard, like the the fog of war, as they say, to like find actual information. But um, like how, how, where do you turn to like right now you're trying to figure out what happened the past 24 hours in Russia slash Ukraine, where, what website, which videos, which sources, where are you going? I mean, at most, if I just need like a basic thing, I'll use just something like the New York times. because like, they have the resources, you know, to send journalists and stuff and they have sources there. So at most, if I just need like an update on something, I'll usually turn to them or like a wire service, so, like the AP or Reuters. Cause like, I'd say more so, I guess those one things is they're just purely there for reporting. And I guess for some like New York Times, there's reporting, but obviously there's, you know, opinion pages and stuff like that. So like, and kind of they can do it too on spin. I'd, but I'd say like, you know, stuff like that or like the Financial Times, which kind of like the Financial Times at the end of the day is like a business newspaper. So like, they need things to be uh, sort of as clear because, you know, at the end of the day, like there are people reading or it affects the market. So like if they make a mistake, you know, that affects the market, you know, that can tank some of these problems. Mm. So like they're kind of very much, if you did, if they just need straight things, obviously like once you go into like analysis or stuff like that, they can be a little kind of uh, iffy on like sort of different political parties or stuff like that. But um, they're good on like just basic kind of information. I'll say also like, I used this like back in 2014, like when the when like Crimea first happened, and like the Syrian civil war. It was like the it's called like Live Map. That sort of it's a collection of different data, or it's Live AU Map. I should be more a Live AAU Map. Make what sure I get mean? it right. Uh, it's so it's uh, it's just sort of uh, it's uh, oh Universal Awareness Map. So it's Live Universal Awareness Map. And so it compiles all the reports from like these different news services and stuff like that. And sort of uh, kind of track, it takes like basically like Google and, or Google Maps and kind of you know, track like on pins, certain developments that happen and things like that. So I use that like to track the Syrian civil war and when the war in Ukraine first kind of happened in 2014. And so like right now, like honestly, like that's kind of been another way I've been using to read stuff. It, it's been kind of spotty recently because like a lot of people like now started using it. So it, like it's been kind of inundated with like a lot of users and you know, it's been slow, but I, I'd say that's pretty good also. Yeah, I mean, honestly, so like with stuff like Twitter, cause that's like a big thing with Twitter is like um, what you see on there, there's a lot of like just random stuff, you know, there's like videos from like back in 2014 that were being shared that were like, oh, this is now or like videos from like Gaza 
of like bombings uh, from there that were like being sent to Ukraine. So like people were kind of like kind of going around sharing a bunch of random stuff. So I'd say like with stuff like that, you have to be more, I'd say, critical of because like you know when people don't kind of list sources there, it's, it gets hard to understand what's going on. Yeah, total. I I think you touched on a good point. Um, is I, I kind of was intrigued by Financial Times and like you were saying how they have a natural incentive to not screw up the entire economy or yeah. like the stock market um, to like, they have their own incentive to tell and make truthful um, stories or like truthful, like just fact in their, yeah. in their journalism versus I feel like the reverse is for most news organizations, just like within America, like CNN, Fox, all those mm-hmm. is just, they have incentive to blow up the truth in a direction that they want to go and like try to funnel everything only this way or only that way to just com- complete their narrative and how how would you say that you could provide maybe a natural incentive towards these corporations like maybe the financial times does yeah to allow them to or like kind of intrinsically force them to make more um objective content uh i mean honestly it really just kind of comes down to like the business models because like uh like kind of media at the end of the day largely you know throughout its history it's financial incentives so like it really just depends i think on like how like where that's motivated or like where it kind of like their media is focused on so like financial times that's focused on like investors and stuff like that and these people who like need just kind of the straight facts, whereas like stuff like CNN or like Fox or MSNBC, that's like a lot more like focused towards like your average person, which you know isn't I guess making those decisions in the market or stuff like that. So like like it's it's kind of like two different incentives. So I guess it really just comes down to like curtailing the incentive to like be opinionated or um, sort of kind of go for the clicks or stuff like that, and I think that. Can evolve like I have to have a like, specific answer. Like, I mean, I think that really just kind of comes down to like kind of the business model. That I don't know if like you really can kind of curtail that stuff, or I mean, maybe you can curtail like the most bad kind of like excesses of it. So, like, this of course gets in like issues like government regulation and stuff like you like you do have stuff like the parents doctrine and stuff like that that were, um, and so like that was past, you know, when K, uh, K, or TV was kind of was first created, and that was like saying that, you know, your original networks, ABC, CBS, and um, NBC, you know, so kind of like all throughout, up until like the 90s, you know, those were the three main networks, and you kind of, they had to like, at least give air time to like both sides and sort of be objective in a certain sense, and obviously like they weren't perfect, you know, they had failures on like covering like Vietnam or other kind of uh, issues like the Cold War, and like stuff like civil rights, but I'd say it largely could have kept a balance and obviously stuff like that was very much kind of gotten rid of in the 90s during deregulation so like i think maybe if you're going to start somewhere you could probably start with like maybe reintroducing concepts or like stuff like that of course that obviously now that we have like the internet and stuff you know not everybody watches cable tv so like it gets on the like regulations in the internet and stuff like that which like and there's like a million sites so it, it gets a lot harder i'd say mm. there isn't like one kind of perfect bullet i'd say it. is the standard american or citizen are they are they desiring or even wanting to like are they like capable of understanding these elite scholarly sources or is the reason why we have cnn is just like we're gonna flash something at you to make you feel like you know what you're talking about and then and then like is that just why we have it is because like most people just don't want to take the time to do more than feel like some dude on the TV's opinion on something and then take that as fact. Like, uh, I mean, it's probably maybe a mix. I feel like the average person can, you know, understand these things. It's just that it really is like living in like just such a modern age of like all this information. It's like, you know, trying to drink out of like a fire hose. It's just so much information just gets blasted at you and you're like, and like, you know, people and like why I guess, you know, certain figures like cable news people kind of like pop up is because like, you know, yeah, people don't have the time. Um, 
like specific narratives, you know, and have their own politics. And so like, you know, people like specific stories and like those people like, you know, can tell like stories that they like. So they might be directed towards that person. So it, it's kind of like, I'd say more so like, it's a mix of kind of all these things of like just mass kind of like information overload, and, uh, you know, people kind of seeking out, I'd say more information they want rather than like kind of just being a blank person and like someone influencing them. It, it's kind of like all kind of all over the place really. For sure. Um, so I know you um, are in the, in the middle of a like large um, research project into the Irish in New York City in the 1870s kind of era um how how has like i mean obviously you can tell first and but like where are you even drawing that information from like what is that just like newspaper clippings from 1873 or something like like compare like what is the dichotomy from that what's going on right now versus what was going on then and like how are you able to come to this conclusion where you can make a well educated research paper so that is, uh, it's a huge, uh, I'd, I'd say it's a kind of a big undertaking. I, I don't want to like rank say I'm like doing this massive thing. You know, there, there are people <laughs> do a lot more work. So, uh, I'm just not under- A lot of work. Yeah. How long have you been working on this? Uh, since at the very least uh, last year. So, oh, well, it has to be like 2020 in the fall. It's sort of when I sort of started So working. like 18 months guess, is what you're saying? Yeah. Much, yeah. Okay. Almost. So this is a large, under- did John, this is a. Uh... This is like what, like I, I'm saying, I took breaks in the seven, eight yeah. percent of your life, dog. Yeah, you know, it's not full, you know, 24 hours sometimes. Family. Okay, but, well, uh, you're sleeping yeah. at least. Yeah, Good lord, I have a life outside of this, <laughs> but um, no, so that I guess I can start at the beginning of that is um, so like that, I guess what interests me, like honestly, like why I decided to do something like that is um. You know, so like here at Illinois, like my original, um, I applied to Illinois and that was as history, you know, I, I did uh, political science and IR second. That was like my, my always focus has always been history. That's kind of my favorite stuff you know, ever since like elementary school, you know, just reading like World War II stuff or, you know, just random, you know, historical facts. But um, it's like that started really just, I was kind of, I'd heard, you know, the department did, uh, like this department here does like, you know, these, if you want to do, you can do honors thesis. And so I said, you know, I, you know, a few students have done that, you know, I thought, you know, it'd be a nice thing to cap out my time here, you know, be able to produce something that I'm proud of. Um, and so that it was really just a mix of like, I guess, um, you know, my family's always had a connection to Ireland and things like that and the Irish, and that's kind of been a somewhat present part of my life. So I found, you know, I want to do something with that, but I, I kind of like, my folks, I do like kind of American history, so I want to bring it back to America and sort of, you know, see what I can find there. And with that, I discovered sort of this case of um, what are called the Orange Riots. And this was a case of uh, massive political unrest throughout the 1870s in New York City uh, that saw like Protestants in New York City fight uh, Catholics, both of Irish descent, and sort of uh, resulted in multiple riots in the city. The second riot, which happens in 18, uh, 1871, is the second dead place in New York City's history by the draft. Oh, only happened a few uh, years earlier. And so with that, I was like, oh, this is pretty interesting. Uh, I wonder if I can see, what, see what's written on this. And there's, there's honestly not a lot written about it at all. I found one book that I've you sort of just kind of like the base that's like did the research and it came out like early, I mean, I like 1998 or like 2000. So it's kind of very, I don't say dated, it, it does a lot of kind of like establishes the groundwork of like scholarly work, but yeah, it's it's a very not, I'd say a reported area. And so like, and so with that, I was like, all right, this is the project I'll do. You know, I'll look at this event, kind of look at New York City and this era of American history in general, pull something out of it. And so from there it's been, yeah, like reading these books or reading this one book um, and then sort of going to other sort of books that have been written at the period. And it's a lot of, yeah, like newspaper clippings um, and media of the period from like New York Times to like the Herald or like Harper's Weekly kind of magazines that like still, still exist, you know, uh, like the Times or Harper's, but also, you know, ones that have gone away like the Herald. 
and also reading like letters from people and um, also uh, visiting archives. That's sort of a, one thing that's been pretty interesting, you know, that I had, didn't, haven't really, you know, had a chance to do since then is like visiting, going to a, like a library or something like that and seeing, you know, preserved notes from like the uh, Tammany Hall, you know, the guys, the political machine of New York City at the period, and seeing, you know, what they wrote about, like not only this riot, but also just like random city uh, operations in the period. So it, it's kind of this huge kind of collection that I'm trying to work and do like a story. So mm. yeah, that's kind of how it's been going so far. <laughs> so how does the story start? Uh, I mean, honestly, you know, I, I, I've sort of been focusing on, I'd say, kind of like how I want to structure it is obviously tell a story of, uh, like this is at the end of the day, a story of the United States in the Gilded Age, this era of coming out of the Civil War, huge kind of industrial um, achievements and, you know, advances in technology, but also an era of, kind of mass kind of uh, economic inequality and sort of, you know, you see rising fortunes of Carnegie, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, kind of like Jay Gould, all these or huge titans of industry, the robber barons, but then just, you know, the mass kind of in many for the workers in this period, you know, immiseration and things like that. So it, it comes at this period, it's in New York City kind of very much, that's kind of the framework because it's this era of, you know, huge economic inequality, but also achievement and so instability. Period. So it's a city kind of on the brink of uncertainty about what the future is. And so from there, you know, we go into Irish immigration and that, you know, starts with the famine, you know, in, 1840s in Ireland, um, you know, the Irish come over in large waves to the U.S., and that, of course, causes tensions, you know, with an America that is largely, you know, Protestant, uh, English, you know, founded or uh, you know, settled, settled, so Irish, you know, largely Catholic and hostile to the British, you know, uh, colonial rule over there results in sort of uh, increased tensions. And, of course, then there's the economic issue of, you know, these are new immigrants who are you know, coming from, you know, very poor farming backgrounds, thrown into the cities um, and across, you know, maybe uptown, you know, you have a, an established, you know, Protestant class that is, I'd say middle class emerging, but also, you know, upper class. And so they are, you know, there's class conflict there. And so it's all these things building. You have uh, an interesting thing I discover, or I'd say I want to add into this as this issue of, you um, Irish rebellion. So you have Ireland itself goes through multiple rebellions against the British, you know, from right uh, from the 1798 to, uh, to 1916, you know, all the way to the War of Independence in 1919. And so during this period, you have Irish former veterans from the Civil War uh, who will come and take up arms against the British and fight in places like Canada and, and beat back the British in certain instances, ultimately be crushed. But will, you know, create these fraternal organizations that will do stuff like that in Britain or in uh, Canada, and then also go to Ireland and start up rebellions there. And, and they're in the city operating this period. So it's all these forces kind of emerging. Uh, I guess to bring it back to like sort of the class conflicts period, you have the Paris Commune and sort of increasing like socialist ideas that come and conflict with, you know, uh, and, and match with Irish uh, groups, but also conflict with sort of American ideals of capitalism, stuff like that. So it's this, it's very much kind of this issue of, uh, you know, this New York City very much kind of like on the brink of just, you know, the new age, basically, you know, the 21st century or the 20th century coming to it. And like all these ideas kind of going around and, you know, people are kind of uncertain. And of course, you know, violence results from that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> It's a, it's a lot to take in, I'd say. Yeah, so, so explain maybe the, uh, what, so you have the Protestants and the Catholics, both from Irish descent, mm -hmm. and these are the people that are going at each other. I'd say largely, yeah. I mean, largely. it's, I guess what we, we consider it, um, so in, I guess, uh, what the conflict, honestly, that I'm trying to draw parallels to in my uh, writing is that it's it's very much re uh, replicates you know, what happens in Northern Ireland in uh, through, I mean, throughout the Ireland history, but also most notably, I think that people know is from like the 60s to the 90s, what's called the Trouble, so that violence of uh, happening in Northern Ireland, so between Catholics and Protestants. So what happens in New York is you have obviously Irish Catholics, they come over, and the Protestants are 
what are called like Scotch Irish. Um, and you know, they had come over earlier. Uh, in Ireland, they are more dominant in the north, and sort of you know, there are people from Scotland and England who come over, settle in Northern Ireland and throughout Ireland, and all, and then eventually you know they go to the U.S. And so it's and so, uh, but those people were largely, I'd say, favored by the British in many cases during uh, their rule over Ireland, and so that of course creates historical enmity, and uh, sort of so the name of the riots, the Orange Riots, comes from this case of uh, what are called like, uh, they, they do these every, um, every, it's July the 12th. And so every year on July the 12th, Protestants in the North will do sort of marches throughout, um, you know, wearing kind of like orange vests and um, kind of like orange regalia. We'll do these marches throughout the island or at, throughout the North and through cities like um, Derry or um, Belfast and sort of celebrate uh, what happened on July the 12th uh, in it was the 1600s, which was basically the Protestant king, William of Orange, defeated Catholic uh, King James in Ireland. And they, of course, resulted in uh, British rule over the island. So it's that celebration. These orange marches celebrate, obviously, that continued uh, that sort of victory over the Catholics. And so you see what happens uh, in New York in this case is those marches happen. And of course, the Catholics don't like it because it reminds them, you know, they view it as antagonistic. And so that, of course, results in violence to occur. So it's, it's these two communities that kind of have their, their disagreements in Ireland and in the north of Ireland, you know, immigrate to the United States across the Atlantic Ocean and still, you know, hold with them these kind of tensions and frustrations and hatreds against each other and, you know, fight each other in New York City, even though after all these, all these years have passed by, it's, it still existed at this point in the 1870s. So, so how does this how does this conflict conclude how do we how do we find resolve uh i mean largely it was i'd say subsumed in like the kind of issues of the period it just kind of uh the issues honestly i'd say of like economic like of the gilded age kind of just it sort of like trumped it eventually and sort of died down in that sense like um this is kind of a larger thing of like that sort of ethnic heritage kind of receded as you know years progressed. It's it's a big thing about like uh, there's an old historical book. It's a great book called uh, How the Irish Became White, and it basically talks about how the Irish um, in the United States, you know, originally reviewed kind of ostracized, uh, not to the extent obviously of African Americans, you know, who were slaves or Native Americans you know, who faced uh, wars and uh, genocide, but um. You know, they faced as kind of like one of the large big immigrant groups, they faced sort of ostracization in kind of these early eras. And eventually they became basically kind of accepted by the power structure. They bought into institutions like the police. Um, that was a big thing in, in on my paper is like the local police in New York City is largely Irish and supportive of the people. And so they have to call in the National Guard in New York City and this conflict, you know, the guards would fire on. Irish and there's this whole violence, but you know, so they're like the Irish are kind of uh, become bought into like these institutions, um, you know, and they become accepted in many ways. You know, you see similar things with like Italians, and they become sort of yeah, they become white as sort of the book talks about. Like they they get accepted and as part of kind of this broad history. And I see kind of see I'd say we still, you know, there's like obviously ethnic heritage months and stuff like that. And, and I'd say like in Chicago, I guess it's more personal things like, you know, like I'd say like there's, you, you kind of have to look for it, but you know, you still have like bullish events. And um, I think of uh, what is, you know, like uh, it's the German fest, like German uh, Oktoberfest and stuff like that. Like, you know, you still have, I'd say like kind of light stuff and St. Patrick's Day, obviously that's, you know, massive in, this, in Chicago. Mm. We, we died the river green and stuff like that. Yeah, we but, uh, it's always fun to see that um but i'd say like largely like kind of that ethnic uh kind of tension receded just due to being adapted into like these political structures and just i'd say like other events of the period like economic inequality during the gilded age kind of trumped it you know irish became more aligned with like uh, other groups uh and so like kind of sort of receded in the background in those ways and honestly, like they were kind of they, like they were clamped down hard against you know the 
the state militia and National Guard brought in and the power structures in New York, well, like Tammany supported them in many ways, it, they just kind of destroyed them in the face of like more upper elites, you know, who were kind of in the governor's mansion and kind of around the country, which viewed this as like, you know, the situation's untenable, you know, you guys can't continue to support this stuff or, you know, basically operate the sectarian conflict because it's, it's gonna, you know, result in more people dying and stuff like that. And so like, you know, just kind of gets clamped down hard against. Uh, there's actually an interesting history of like school, like stuff in like schools, like school textbooks and like issues of like Catholic schooling that I'm trying to work into that like happens in this period. Um, it's sort of, it's very kind of under, I think, you know, like going back to like AP stuff, I remember like, it, it's like, we never really talked about this stuff. And obviously like, you know, you're jamping in like a ton of US history in like a year. Like it is very interesting, like kind of like what stuff gets brought up and not and like, and, and like sort of it's this, it's this massive, I'd say, you know, ethnic conflict that, you know, many people don't know about. Yeah. As a person that's studying, um, you know, your history buff, as you probably would say, or like your uh, politics, international relations, what um as you've like studied this like how much have you found that's just not in the textbooks like there's just not in public education and like what would be some of the bigger events that are left out um all right see well that's interesting so uh during like last year like in 2020 i was very bored with covid so, like, i was just going through like random stuff at home like <laughs> looking through like the old AP textbooks. Yeah, I was just like reading anything that like, came my mind uh, for stuff. And interesting with that is I looked through, I think it was the AP textbook from 2015 when I took the class. It was like 2015 to 2016. So it was like the newest version. And so interesting that book, I'd say it was a pretty kind of like good overview, but it interestingly, it didn't talk at all about the pandemic of 1918. Uh, so like that was you know the deadliest pandemic in the country's history at that point and it also didn't talk about it was a textbook that went up to 2015 in its history but it didn't also talk about Rodney King and sort of what was at that point uh the sort of you know this large uprising against you know police brutality so I found and especially in the year 2020 when we both had a pandemic and you know a uprising against police brutality I found that very interesting that like you know this AP textbook you know that's supposed to be this big overview didn't mention these two major events in history so I mean, I think in terms of like stuff that's in, it largely just comes down to, with well, something like that, I honestly think it was really just like over, over, so like they just didn't really like kind of, like they were just kind of rushed and like it's stuff you have to remember on a test. So like you don't do analysis and you just, you need dates and you need numbers and stuff like that. And like that stuff you usually don't put on there. Uh, but like the other things, I just like, um, like, I don't think I've we ever, like, Lombard West, I don't think we ever had, like, people not want to put stuff in textbooks with, like, stuff like that. Yeah, it was, like, AP stuff. It was really just, like, kind of down, like, stuff has to be cut, has to be cut for time. But, like, obviously, like, around the country, I think, more recently, I think there's been controversies over what's in textbooks and what's not. And I think that's more, like, obviously, political reasons, stuff like that. You know, people don't want to teach a specific history. And that, I'd say, is more, like, yeah, politically motivated, stuff like that. But honestly, like, I haven't, in my opinion, like I read a bunch and so like, and go out and seek stuff. So like, I, I, I haven't really run into, other than that, that case, the AP textbook, I haven't really run into any issues with like stuff being purposely cut. That's it. <laughs> you were mentioning the, um, the political um, kind of ties to history and in a way removing history that doesn't, um, or removing parts of history or, or data that just doesn't back um, the narrative or something that they're trying to push. And I don't know, uh, did, like, did you see that um, New York Times article um, about the CDC that was not releasing certain data because it didn't go along with their viewpoints? Uh, I believe so, yeah. So like that, that, that to me is, it's like, it's like terrifying in a way is just that the biggest health organization in the world can just be like, yeah, you know, this data not really doing what I want it to say. So I'm just going to like, whoop, put it away. And that, that, just wild. Like how, how dangerous, how dangerous is 
losing portions of history to political to politics yeah i mean i that's just, i should say like i think history always like it's always something that's inter- up for interpretation like there is i'd say no like 100 percent like even history like that i read i guess that's technically like, that somebody's interpreting that so like there is i'd say like there's a there's like an effort some people make like trying to find like 100 percent like a political history and like that's honestly kind of impossible to do like you're always going to have somebody giving a viewpoint you know we're people at the end of the day but i'd say like largely like yeah stuff like that it's like i always like kind of push back against like that stuff because it's like you know it's it's a historical record you know you need to keep that stuff um even if it's something like boring like you know you need to protect these things <laughs> uh it's it's always kind of critical like you know the kind of read these things and stuff like that because like uh I, I don't want to be like cliche like you can repeat things but like it, it's fairly to do like analysis and like uh do like learn i learn from mistakes you know that's the cliche and stuff like that mm. and uh <clears throat> what what mistakes do you think we uh we haven't learned from in 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 relations um to i feel the current russia ukraine conflict i you know i'm very don't have the same level of knowledge in this as you but it, it does have a lot of um relations to world war ii and um like what what coming out of world war ii and into the cold war may have um set this up that we just didn't we didn't prepare for um i mean it's honestly like it's a lot of stuff i mean i honestly go back to like the 1990s like more still like coming out of the cold war i'd say and like okay. a failure it really is like it's a failure to deal with russia as it exited as, as the soviet union dissolved and like failure to deal with russia and the post-soviet states as they sort of kind of emerged in themselves like we were very zealous i'd say in pushing for like market reforms uh and liberalizing markets you know allowing capitalism stuff like that to flow whereas we were less less concerned about like democracy and democratic rights and things like that like uh the big example is like Boris Yeltsin he's, he's the first Russian or first president of the Russian Federation uh the man for Vladimir Putin and with him he ruled all throughout the 90s and originally he was seen like you know when the Soviet Union was dissolving as kind of like the hero of democracy you know when they had the coup the Soviet Union there was a coup in the, uh, 1991 and you know the hardliners uh brought the tanks into the Moscow streets and tried to prevent, you know, reforms under Gorbachev, things like that. And Yeltsin uh, got out on the streets and, you know, rallied the people and, you know, stood on top of the tanks and, you know, we will not let, you know, this sort of uh, rule by force happen. And, and he's, he's, he was seen, you know, as a hero of democracy. Uh, but then we very much sort of let people, uh, you know, the, we let, but he gets into power and it's really kind of, the country is not prepared to transition to capitalism. You know, you see the creation of the oligarchs, you know, the all the state owned industry is then just sold off. And, you know, people from you know, like what the, we're going to call, I guess you'd say the uh, rush goes through shock therapy, as they called it, period, uh, which is sort of this very much, uh, you know, abrupt transition to capitalism. Uh, I think it was the former, but it was like Clinton. It was, so it's under H.W. Bush and Clinton, are kind of the presidents that oversee this. And, you know, the U.S. tries to help them along, but they really kind of do not help them along. It was Clinton's, like, under, he was the undersecretary of state, and he says, it was Strip Talbot, that was his name, and he says, like, yeah, we did too much shock and not enough therapy. Uh, <laughs> basically, I yeah, see the creation of the oligarchs in which these men, you know, take all the state-owned industry that's now being sold off, and it's privatized, and so they just buy this stuff up for very cheaply, and, um, and then eventually, you know, make millions off this for like the average Russian citizen, you know, is facing, you know, mass immiseration. This is a period that sees like the largest drop in life expectancy in Russia um, and sort of just, you know, people use pensions and kind of savings and all this stuff. They go through multiple economic crises, uh, things like alcoholism skyrocket and like uh, it, Russia still has like a pretty bad birth rate and things like that. You know, it's, it's, it's a pretty horrible time for the average Russian. So like, with that already, kind of this uh, wild west of, you know, the post-Soviet era, um, instability happens, and, you know, we, we don't really kind of help them through that point. And then on the political side, um, 
we, you know, we force the Alton's in power, but, you know, we seen this at first democratic figure, but he increasingly becomes authoritarian and it's sort of becomes part of uh, the oligarchs, you know, and he cracks down brutally against uh, uh, sort of the parliament in 1993. And we, we are fine with that, um, you know, and then in 1995, I'm correct, is when the first, first Chechen war happens in which you know, the in internal part of Russia, Chechen, uh, of <clears throat> Chechnya, uh, kind of facing an uprising. You know, these are ethnically Muslims uh, of Chechens. And the, 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 they have an uprising and Russia brutally cracks that down. Hundreds of thousands of people, are lost, lives are lost. Um, and it's, you know, it's the destruction of a major European city, you know, since at, at this point, um, I've seen Sarajevo at the point, but basically since the Second World War, we haven't seen that sort of damage. But the US pretty much backs them, or at least they're, I mean, we're critical in some aspects of the war, but we're fine with that. And, and then eventually Yeltsin sort of, kind of in age and mental health, you know, he's committed all these crimes and sort of been complicit in many ways. They helped kind of steal an election in 1996 to prevent the communists from coming back into power. Um, and so he's, you know, he's a compromised figure. And after that, he just, he gives power to Putin at the end of the day and because Putin won't prosecute him and stuff like that. And Wait, so explain um, that transition because that's something of interest to me is so this is like late late nineties, right? Is yeah. So, the transition. Uh, yeah. So and like Yelt sorry, yeah, you were saying. Oh, I was just gonna clear it's just like so Yeltsin Yeltsin, right? Yeah. Yeltsin uh, basically he, he resigns as the leader of Russia and then Putin just kind of swoops in. Yeah, they did they had a number of prime ministers at this point. And then Putin becomes prime minister, uh late nineties, I think it's nineteen ninety-nine. And they have the second Chechen war after a number of sort of apartment bombings throughout Russia, which have dubious kind of causes if they were Chechen, but yeah, they initiate another war. And that of course is another brutal war, which is flattened like even more. I'd say the first Chechen war is the Russians do to kind of take a beating, but like the second Chechen war is just flattening the entire city into ferocity and brutal, really just brutal against the Chechens. And Putin is kind of seen as but it's seen as a Russian victory, more so than the second Chechen war. And Putin is kind of seen as the hero there. And then eventually, yeah, Yeltsin resigns. I think it's Christmas Eve, or it's either Christmas or New Year's Eve in like 1999. And he gives power to Putin. Uh, and so, and mainly that's because, you know, Putin is this man who before this worked in uh, St. Petersburg for the may uh, mayor there. And, you know, was kind of seen as ba his bag man and, you know, a man who wouldn't, you know, he protects, he protects his friends. And so with Putin, it's, it's a man who'll protect Yeltsin and his family for, you know, the crimes and sort of publicity that they have. And so uh, with that, yeah, yeah, Putin is seen as the protector at that point. That's kind of why he really gets the presidency at that point. And then he's been, he's, and then after that, you know, he goes on to commit his crimes, things like that, and sort of, he insulates himself. And yeah, he's, he's there till this day, as of right now. <laughs> Wasn't there a stretch? So his rule, ended i believe in 2008 and then he steps back down as like he like swoops in as like oh i'm prime minister now yeah till 2012 and then all of a sudden he just decides that he's um the leader again like how wh what was that what's that what, what what's going on there? so the issue with that, that that's a that's a very funny sort of he pulls a nice political trick there is that the russian constitution said that you can serve two consecutive terms but um, you can't, you can't serve, you know, three consecutive terms, but it doesn't say about non-consecutive terms. So like he serves two terms and then has his man, uh, Dmitry Med Medvedev come in, uh, who is his prime minister kind of all throughout this time. He's, he's still there. I think he resigned recently. I think it was 2018 or 19 as prime minister, but he's still there as a, kind of like an advisor to him, but he has uh, Medvedev come in service president and Putin goes to the role of prime minister and then they change the constitution or they've done a number of changes but he, he runs again in 2012 and because you know it's technically a non-consecutive term like it it's doesn't it's not there's term limits about when you can serve together but not full like term limits on like how many terms you can serve because it's not consecutive he gets in there and, and and recently they changed the constitution where like he can be in there they got kind of got rid of all that stuff so like he's in there now but that was really just yeah him pulling a nice kind of political trick from there. 
and how i mean in this country you could you could never just change the constitution how do you how does how does the role of putin like how does how can he just do uh, that? it's really just like uh doing stuff in the russian parliament and the duma so it was obviously they don't have the in, in the u.s you know you have to get Congress, the first has to, you know, go through Congress. And then after it goes to Congress, it has to be ratified by all the states. And so with that, obviously, um, he doesn't have, or I think it's three-fourths of the state, or it's a majority of the states, pretty much. Um, uh, and so with Putin, he doesn't have that sort of um, uh, stomach block of the states. And and I guess, you know, with Congress, that would be, a, a Duma now, his parliament is, I'd say, largely, you know, supportive of him. And, so like they're able to kind of like send that through and obviously doesn't have been all the state ratifications to like with that it was a lot easier process than you could say like maybe ex- adding at the very least you know a constitutional amendment in the u.s so i think the last one was it's the 1970s it, it, it what allows you know young people to vote it's the most recent amendment and then before that you had like the era which almost got the state read it got through congress and then it, it uh, stumble at like the states because they couldn't get enough states to ratify it and then, yeah we really haven't had any constitutional amendments since then wow will we have any more uh honestly it's depends on congress it depends on the states really like you really have to have like i think lock on like a congress like the states in congress really and i feel like it's e- it's easier to maybe get that in congress but that's a hard that's a hard bargain now yeah. than if you're <laughs> getting like three, four of the states to do it, that, that's an even harder bargain. So for the foreseeable future, I do not see any constitutional moments coming. Um, I guess uh, back to, back to Mr. Mr. Putin here. So um, is Putin just planning to, is he just gonna rule until he dies? And like, is he, is this, I know there is some kind of narrative in the media that's like, Putin's trying to create this legacy for himself by this war and he's trying to leave his mark in Russian history or Soviet history is like is there any truth to that I mean honestly it really is kind of impossible because it's like you know who, who can know the mind of the man sure <laughs> it's it's you know we're a thousand miles away kind of just watching this I mean if I'm on if history is any indicator I'd say like he was would probably like I mean he's he I think the recent invasion very much complicates a lot of things about this because like he was seen I'd say largely as kind of like a rational actor like a man who would you know take things and commit crimes and you know kill people but it'd be kind of more covert kind of like what they did in um, Ukraine in 2014 with you know swooping into Crimea very quickly and then starting a civil war in the east and kind of fueling that for a bit kind of being, and, and what they did in Georgia in 2008, kind of, kind of being more, rather than a full invasion, just kind of like these proxy conflicts and being more um, covert with stuff and, and it's like doing stuff on like the internet or something like that. But like with the invasion now, it really is, yeah, a question of, you know, there's people think is like, has he lost it or, um, you know, was, is there people around him? Like, has he just gotten rid of all the people who will say like, no, or like maybe question things and like, you know, he's just full of yes men that say like, you know, yes, go ahead. And, you know, he just went along with that. He, I mean, he is, he's 69 now. So he turned 70 this year. So like, he is an older man. He's, he's getting up there. And so like, he probably, yeah, well, either considering like he's, you know, extended term lives and all that stuff, like he will probably either, he's probably will die in that position as president or, like, it, I doubt he'll resign. Like, I don't think he'll find, like, you know, his Putin, as Yeltsin did. Um, he'll either, yeah, die as, as president as that person or, you know, be removed in, like, a coup or a revolution, which he very much does not want to happen. You know, he does not want to end up like Saddam Hussein or Muammar Gaddafi, or those figures, or Viktor Yanukovych, <laughs> the former president of Ukraine, you know, who was kicked out in 2014. He does not want to end up like those guys. What is um, Putin doing? What is he doing to prevent that? Uh, I mean, it really is just like, it, it's this, it was a large, it's, I'd say it's a large project of like, sort of the right, like kind of insulating his power in Russia was, you know, creating a narrative, I'd say, is 
setting himself up as like a hero of the Russian of the Russian Federation and the Russian people, um, you know, coming out of the '90s, saying like, "I'm not that person who's gonna," you know. He, I mean, there was like an increase in life expectancy, like economic opportunities since like in the 2000s, you know, with high oil prices and stuff like that. And like things did relatively get better at that point. So like, he obviously he sets himself up there as like, I've saved you from like this, you know, disaster of the 90s. And then also there's like kind of traditional nationalism of like making Russia a world power and things like that. That gets kind of the you know, average person on board. You know, in the same way, get like the average person on board in either you know Germany or the UK or uh, Brazil or the US. Um, so there's that, and obviously another part is like political repression. It's a huge part of it. You know, it's we're seeing obviously now. I'd say they they didn't expect. I think the opposition they'd face. You know, we are seeing anti-war protests in Russia. You know, in large numbers, and all those protests are illegal. You know, you have to go through a number of hoops to like get a permit to protest, and obviously those won't be accepted. So like. Uh, you know, and, you know, those people are being arrested and there's obviously police brutality there and all that, all these cases and you know, they face years in prison. So like it is, he very much did build both, I guess, a national state in the past and also like a police state, as one could say. And so like those things going together and just sort of like creating in the political sphere, like very much like apathy, you could say in politics, like a lot of the parties, like since Putin right as power are like, like second largest are the communist party and they in many ways are like kind of implicit in a lot of what putin's party the uh, united russia party right? it's either united or just russia but it's like kind of which is i guess you could say a center right and a more right-wing party you know it's nationalistic versus the communists which ostensibly would be like the left-wing party but like they are many ways kind of just go along with putin you know they might criticize him but you know they they very much uh, have reconciled with like the, uh, the Orthodox Church, which is you know a big supporter of Putin and sort of uh, kind of support you know foreign policy decisions in Ukraine or Syria. So like your your political avenues are closed. Yeah, your other big party, I guess, in Russia is the Liberal Democrats, which are like even more right wing party that have existed in the '90s. You know, in which some have described as like neo fascists and stuff like that. Like people who kind of exist to just be like, oh, Putin's more sane compared to like these guys. <laughs> Like it, it, in like the political space, a lot of that stuff is like just closed in like electoral politics, I should say. Like that stuff is like, so you have electoral politics that is kind of just like a dead end, you know, and also, you know, you have political figures that if you do try and run, you'll face repression there, uh, whether that's like a figure like Alexei Navalny or certain like left wing candidates who also, you know, face repression. And then, yeah, you have an economic space, which at the time, I'd say for 2014, you know, as Putin was viewed as like rebuilding the country, rebuilding like Russian image. And so basically like all these kind of things kind of mix around to like create kind of, I'd say like a, a public that might just be apathetic at most or supportive. But I, I'd say though, that's maybe cracking or it wasn't always, he, it wasn't always a hold, I'd say. Like it, it's, it's a mistake to say like Russia's like, the Russian people are like a monolith and believe all these things, you know, they're very diverse people. people and their own views and i think like yeah with the anti-war protests we're seeing now in russia that's a good example of like what you know how these things aren't necessarily you know single state and stuff like that you know he, he doesn't have a hold fully on power so it really is up to i'd say the future of like what's going to happen now i'd say yeah the future really is kind of sort of in russian people's hands of what happens now in many ways yeah it i do know that like putin's poll like polling is like good it's like favorable like a majority i'm pretty sure 75 i saw 75 percent of people are in favor of putin currently which like is that even true like i don't it's obviously a mix i'd say it definitely i think in many ways has it's decreased in many ways since like i think his peak like peak putin was like that early 2000 early to mid 2000s even into the, like the invasion of Crimea in 2014 in Eastern Ukraine. And I'd say maybe a little bit more to like intervention in Syria, but I'd say it's steadily started to go down a bit. Um, and you're seeing maybe more dissenting opposition. Like you saw in 20, uh, 2020, 2014 or 2021, I was forget like kind of in January when we had protests against um, uh, his jailing of uh, dissent, uh, Alexei Navalny, 
and Nivolti is kind of his own character in many ways, but um, you know, he was seen as kind of an opposition to Putin and, and, uh, and sort of kind of a figure who certain people could rally behind him. Um, while polling sort of there was a little bit, it did, polling did show kind of a dip in some support for Putin. He's still maintaining, obviously, like he's still popular, relatively speaking, but like I'd say it, it's nowhere near as popular as it used to be. I mean, it's, it's starting to sort of like kind of dip down a bit, I'd say. And especially like, I'd say big thing now is honestly like this war in Ukraine very much has the possibility to like make that pulling go a lot worse considering like, um, you know, Russian soldiers are going to come back in body bags like that. Like people are going to see their families, you know, you know, Russian families are going to see, you know, their sons and uh, husbands, you know, killed and that, that can very much, and considering how they sort of laid out the groundwork for this war, whether it was like, you know, we'd be greeted as sort of liberators or this like military operation and like they're an exercise and sort of that sort of lying and sort of deceiving the public can very much crack him. There's, uh, I guess, an example, this is, it was the early 2000s, like early Putin's presidency, you had was uh, you heard of the Kursk disaster? No. Submarine. No. Um, so it was, it was a Russian nuclear submarine that they had this big naval operation in early 2000, and the submarine had a malfunction and uh, sort of there was a torpedo malfunction. The submarine, you know, there was an explosion. The submarine, you know, damaged itself and was slowly slowly sinking to the bottom of the ocean. The nuclear sub. Oh my god! And no. the Russian Navy very much kind of. Uh, you know, it was at like the West and many like NATO, they said, you know, they could help, but they very much kind of ignored that. And, you know, the soldiers, the sailors eventually all died, you know, because they were, they couldn't rescue them. But um, in response, like there was very much large public anger against, and Putin went out to see the families and they were very like angry at him and, you know, showed his anger. And so like, I think, and that way I'd say like, it was very much, I'd say like a lasting impression on him. It's like, he really did see a public that hated him for like, you know, letting their sons and husbands die and, you know, not trying to help them at all. And so like, I'd say something like the war in Ukraine very much has the ability to like become something like that. Whereas like the public will turn against them, you know, when they see you know, their family members have been killed in this war that might be, you know, viewed as his undertaking rather than like a Russian effort you know, to help the world or something like that. That's so, so, so why now? Why, why are we, why February 24th, 2022? Why invade then? Uh, I mean, honestly, I don't know. Cause like, I'll, I'll be like, truthful, like I honestly like it had because I was like, why now? Yeah, I was like, yeah, I was like, what's going on now? Like, why specifically? Uh, you know, we've had like buildups before in the past, like in the East and all that stuff. So like, and, and I'd say like more confrontational stuff, you know, why didn't they do this like back in like, 2015 or something like that? And honestly, can't really put a finger like why it is. I have like some suspicions, like, yeah, something like, yeah, Putin is getting older up there and like kind of needs to secure himself. Uh, I guess you could say like a legacy or something like that, but and like the political situation might not be uh, become you know more unstable for him. So like he wants to do this now versus like maybe in a few months or a year or so. Um, and maybe like he saw there's obviously a situation in Ukraine was I'd say, but like it really is kind of a mystery in many ways. It's something yeah we're probably not going to figure out until at least a year at that until, or maybe like you know, a few months later, like. No, we're, we're still in the very early days. I'd say it's going to take a while I'd say, to find out what the reason was for this now. I think I was seeing something about um, just the amount of military-aged men in Russia are starting to decline. So yeah. there was like a, oh, I wonder if we got to do this now because um, of like... Otherwise, like our influence is yeah. going to start to deteriorate. I mean, that has largely been, I'd say, like a consistent issue in Russia. Uh, what's it? I remember it was, do you remember Miss Stone from uh, uh, Glomer West? I don't think I ever had her. Oh, no. Well, it was, I think it was like Human Geo. That's what it was. The big thing oh, was like, okay. and stuff. but we, we talked about um, 
and actually Mr. Haas's class about Russia. We took the whole oh, class okay, okay. about Russia in his um, comparative like international politics. When both those classes, we talked about like how there really is like a huge demographic crisis in Russia. Of, like, like people are like it is really just dropping off. Like about you know because like there's just you know issues of like economic opportunity and stuff like that. And like yeah, people aren't um, having kids or anything like that. And so like I say that probably is an issue. I mean. I, Big thing Russia is like it's a conscription army, so you have military mandatory military service compared to mm-hmm. U.S. professional, and you know you you can apply to or you, yeah you apply to join the army something like that. And so I'd say that I'd say that's probably was a concern at some point. I don't know like I, I don't know like the spe- specific numbers of like when you know that like demographic hammer really hits of like oh we got like nobody left. So like I, I that probably doesn't happen for a bit, but I. I I, that probably is like obviously it's something in the back of the heads I think in Putin's head of like what could happen you know in the future with Russia. Something that um I was I was thinking about is so a lot of um Putin's power amongst Europe is the you know Western Europe and especially Germany's reliance on gas from coming from Russia right yeah and a lot of I mean they have a huge amount of pipelines just like funneling like a half of germany's natural gas and some i think like something like 30 percent of europe's or something like something wild wildly massive influence and so my kind of question is okay so gas heats homes why why invade the end of february when we're coming into spring like why would you why wouldn't you want the pressure why wouldn't you do this in december when you're going to face a long cold winter without russian gas yeah yeah that is an interesting comparison thing because that was a big fear of like european leaders and stuff like that it's like if a war happened russia can just you know shut the taps off and people freeze to death and stuff like that and um i mean honestly like like they really do if like they really did kind of put themselves at the european uh, the European nations, you know, in recent years, really did put themselves in a bind with like the gas and they're being so dependent on Russia, you know, uh, coming out of, um, so like in Germany's case, like there's a very kind of long history of, or at some long, you know, 30 years ago <laughs> is long <laughs> for history person. Uh, but um, so there's, there's very like kind of, that, there's that history of yeah, being in, intertwining yourself with Russia and the gas companies there, like, uh, the former uh, German Chancellor uh, Gerhard Schröder uh, was like he's he still sits on the board of Gazprom, you know, one of the largest companies. And it was a kind of big kind of proponent of uh, uh, you know these projects. And uh, Merkel, under her term, uh, there was following Fukushima. You know, there was very much kind of an anti-nuclear phase in Germany that saw like this getting rid of nuclear power plants or shutting down many of them. Yeah, you know, reverting to German gas and things like or Russian gas. And so now I'd say there's an issue, like it hasn't, they haven't really sort of it's it's I'd say it's been a I'd say a significant shift in Germany recently and throughout the West and Western Europe and Eastern Europe of like getting away from this now. Like they're really I'd say now taking it seriously of like not doing all this stuff with gas, like. Uh, the German Greens who are in a coalition with the Germany's government of the, the SPD and uh, the <clears throat> FDP, kind of those that governing coalition there. Uh, the Chancellor uh, Olaf Scholz has said that, like, you know, we're gonna not only reinvest in the military, you know, we're gonna sort of start looking at options away from this. German Greens have sort of been opposed the Nord Stream pipeline, the big Russian German pipeline, but have said that they'd be willing in many cases to like look back reevaluate their policy of like nuclear energy and stuff like that. And so uh, there is, I'd say, a significant shift uh, in that policy. The U.S. also is like exporting them more gas and many other countries have been starting to, I'd say since 2014, trying to like get them to get off uh, that Russian gas. It's a, but in terms of like, yeah, February, it's like, I think for many reasons, like it might just have been like good weather or stuff like that like of a specific reason why they did it now rather than the yeah, January when they could like shut the gas off and stuff like that and really make them freeze I think it might honestly be some like weather or something like that like it could, could come down to something like that you know like you want solid ground for tanks to move across the across the 
you know, planes of Ukraine and stuff like that. And it could just come down to, you know, something. Once we, you know, get past all this uh, events and like we fully, you know, we're able to look at the archives and everything, testimonies of what these people say, it might come down to just something simple, as that, honestly. Do you think, like, this is just kind of a shot in the dark theory is like, I would say like either Putin thinks this is going to be a, a quick take of Ukraine and it's just, you know, it I think that he definitely thought that like he, I think that that is the big thing. I think like he miscalculated, like he thought he was going to just roll in there, like in Georgia in 2008 or in Crimea, you know, it might be bloodless as in the case of Crimea or in 2008, like in Georgia, that was like eight days. But yeah, I think he really thought that would be a quick thing. Yeah. You're saying. Or, or, is this a launching point to a larger land grab in Europe or a larger threat in Europe to the point where he's preparing for another, like a, an attack that's going to last and up until the next winter and maybe going for some other thing that's more important and more dangerous than Ukraine? I mean, I honestly think his main focus really was just Ukraine. Like, I'm going to have to make a prediction or, like, an assumption. I think he really just did, he really wanted just Ukraine for that many ways. Like, it's more, uh, it has more of a history, I'd say, with Russia than, like, Poland or Romania. Um, it really is, He, I think in many ways, like, he gave her a speech a few years, uh, a week, I think about a week ago now, where he kind of laid out all this stuff of, like, Ukraine, you know, he denied Ukrainian as like a country or like, you know, and said it's really Russian, stuff like that. And obviously that's him saying these things. But I think in many ways he does think is that as like, as a part of Russia and stuff like that. And so like, with regards to like, if you'll go further, I honestly don't think, and I think that's mainly just because NATO exists. And like, if he goes into Poland, that's war with NATO, Romania, war with NATO, the Baltic States, war with NATO, you know, obviously Belarus is his ally, so he doesn't need to go to war with them. Uh, Finland, and Sweden obviously aren't in NATO, so there's a little more iffy situation there, though. I don't know if they've ever really had aims since then. Moldova is an interesting case because there is like a breakaway region in that country, Transnistria, that Russian peacekeepers are there since I think the 90s. Uh, and they sort of prevent obviously fully being taken back over by Moldova. So, yeah, and that's and they're not in NATO, so there might be something with uh, Moldova there. Uh, I'm obviously still not sure. It's it's a government, and that's become I think more so pro Western recent years. So there could be something if he like like if he if he succeeds in taking over Ukraine or something like that, and puts his sights on somewhere else, it probably would be like Moldova or something like that. But I'd say, <clears throat> yeah, if I'm gonna make a prediction, I think if he does stop at like Ukraine, like he doesn't go into a NATO country. I'll at least say it that way, because that of course is I think he's at least. If he hasn't gone up the deep end yet, he is rational enough to be like, he doesn't want a nuclear conflict and a larger conflict that he won't win at the end of the day. That's Does he, is, is the reason you go after Ukraine, um, is, is he just like, yo, no one's going to do anything about this? Uh, I mean, I think he largely, I mean, he views it as like his sphere of like influence or something like that. Like it's his territory and his view that like, and it's not a part of the EU yet, you know, it's not a part of NATO. And so like he views his ability to like sort of act as his kind of goal. And, you know, we saw the revolution and sort of overthrow the government there in 2014, saw that as a threat. And so from there, he's like, all right, I got to act. Like, I think he probably wanted to invade it if that government stayed in power. Obviously there's a massive issue with that government and it's been with that Viktor Yanukovych and his rule there. But like, he, he probably, I think he, if I'm going to make, yeah, another prediction or like assumption, it's that he probably wanted to do something similar to what he has done like with Belarus, where it's like pretty much just like his ally, like it's a guy who's pretty much subservient to him. And so like if Ukraine was pretty much just, just that, he probably wouldn't have invaded, taking like Crimea and done all this stuff. Like, but now I think that it's firmly like a country that is, you could say like, yeah, supportive of the West or, and trying to, you know, be in the camp of the West uh he probably sees as yeah i gotta do this now like we can't you know wait for an election and see like a supposed pro-russian person come in i have to invade and take over it's like 
in his view, like all that means, like, yeah, NATO, it could join NATO and NATO troops are going to be at the border or something like that. Or at a more larger border. You know? Jeez. And, okay, given the theoretical that Putin, if Putin, if anything goes between NATO and, and Russia, like, what's, like, if there's some kind of attack or violence between the two, like, what, what are, what are we looking like then? Like, uh, I mean, like, obviously it depends on, like, how this happens. Like, <clears throat> uh, like, yeah, if he goes, if he decides, like, I'm going to invade the Baltic states, you know, those guys, like, then that's an act of war that the U.S. will defend and all of us allies will defend. And that's, like, uh, see, what's interesting about this is, like, it's kind of different from, like, what they planned in the Cold War because it's, the assumption there was that Soviet Union would try and like retake West Berlin and maybe the rest of Germany. So you'd have like a massive Soviet troops that move through the country and you would have NATO forces technically like trying to hold them, but they would have to, they would be overrun pretty much because, you know, the Soviet land army was too much for them at that point. And they would then resort to using tactical nuclear weapons. So like smaller nukes that would be deployed. And then from there, people would be like, then it just ex- escalates the nuclear war. So it's, it's kind of different from now, which is that like, I don't think the U.S. I mean, we have nukes in Europe and uh, the Netherlands and and in NATO countries like in Turkey and I think some in Italy at this point. I think also in Belgium, but like it's it's different. Like we they haven't really planned in many ways. Like there's obviously like plans. They've done war games and stuff like that. But like I think in many ways they like accept that like the Baltics will be overrun and like the defense would be like yeah in Poland or like kind of in that sense and like in Romania or something like that. Like kind of. They accept they'll have to lose the territory and, and kind of just hold. And then from there, uh, yeah, either if it gets really bad, then yeah, it becomes a nuclear scenario or they'll hold and, you know, try and work for like a diplomatic scenario or something like that, that will, or a diplomatic kind of solution that could exist. But it really is kind of like a lot of just like assumptions kind of held up by yeah. threats of, you know, mutually sort of destruction. Are you... Are you buying gold? Are you buying land? Are you scared? Are you worried? Or is this just? Uh, I mean, I'm honestly somewhat, I mean, not, I don't want to say like I'm not concerned because like, you know, people are dying in like those areas. Like it, there's a war going on, you know, I fear for like for those people because, you know, it's horrible if they have to go through. But like I think in the U.S., honestly, in Western Europe, I think it's like, I don't think it's as much of a threat or something like that. I, I, I wouldn't say like, because like, I honestly think the U.S. has made its positions clear so far that like, we are not entering this war with troops or anything like that. Um, I also like, think that like, there's a, well, obviously like there's threat of nuclear weapons being used. Like we have been able to deescalate. Like um, there was a case in, I think it was 2015, it was in Syria and it was a case of, you know, the U.S. had forces in Syria supporting its Kurdish rebels. This is, the civil war was going on, and Russia had its forces there. And, you know, U.S. and Russian forces would, like, basically play, like, a deadly game of bumper cars where their convoys would, like, kind of just run into each other at some points and, like, you know, try and intimidate each other. But, like, you know, your tension's there. You had a case where a Russian mercenary group attacked, like, a U.S. Kurdish base and with some help from the Syrian, uh, and militias and army forces and the u.s was like on the phone with like russian generals and they're like you know making sure can we then go to like is this you guys you know there's attempts to de-escalate and then the russians are like now you know this isn't our troops you can pretty much just waste them and they end up just like destroying these guys it's like russian mercenary group oh my god and, like these serious forces uh it's the wagner group it's it's wagner is you know wagner the composer but i guess you know w-a-n-g-e-r wagner it's like if you're an American, you say Wagner. But like that, that was the mercenary group. And they've been used like in Central Africa and in Ukraine as well. But uh that was the case of that event. Um, so like obviously, like there's you know, we we've been to the brink and during the Cold War, like, there are tons of times where like we like you know, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'd say a lot more serious crisis than now because that was direct threat of like use of nuclear weapons, but like. And, you know, the 1983 you know, threats of uh, Soviet fear over um, 
the NATO war games, Abel Archer, but like we've been to the brink, I'd say a lot of times, but we've been able to pull ourselves back, you know? So I feel like at the end of the day, I think there is a, you know, I wouldn't say the situation is as, as dire for people in the West. You know, I've seen if you're in Ukraine, you, know, you face shelling and, um, you know, airstrikes and things like that. And obviously that's a real war there. But I'd say like for the West, that isn't that much of a threat. You're safe in many ways. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so um, this is my thing. I'm also like very much uh, not as uh, I, I very much kind of try not to panic in order. Like, I'd be okay. very cool. Like during COVID, I was very much like try to keep a rational high. Like, you know, we'll get through this things like that. Like, you know, just be safe and stuff like that. Like, I, I wasn't. I I didn't think this would be like you know 28 days later or something like that. <laughs> it's not the zombie apocalypse or something like that. Like, you know, you just always got to kind of be rational. And stuff. Um, yeah, I guess what, what are you, what are you doing? Um, or what are you planning on doing after college? It's quite a transition. <laughs> we go from the apocalypse to what are you doing after college? I mean, same thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, honestly, right now it's sort of a mix of looking for jobs and also like, uh, students on like grad school. Like I, I made a decision like that. I, I, you know, would like to, you know, do more kind of historical research, like kind of maybe pursue, you know, and, or like pursue like MMA and maybe like a PhD and stuff like that. That, of course, obviously takes like a ton of time and like money, you know, that's <laughs> the big thing is money and stuff like that. So like the big thing now is like, I'm just kind of like looking for job opportunities because I, I would like to, you know, make some money and things like that and, you know, have experience, more kind of broader experiences before I, you know, return to going back to the school and things like that you know, and be a little self, be self-sufficient, things like that, you know. I mean, it really is kind of, this is, I guess, more of, uh, you get to take a look into, like, academic, uh, the economy of academia, and that's, like, it doesn't, it's not really that great of, like, a, they pay terrible, always, <laughs> I'll be blunt about that, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, especially, in, like, history and like that, like, it's not that great, and, like, you know, jobs are very limited, so it's, like, if I'm gonna do that stuff, I was, like, I don't want to be like in debt and like, you know, nonstop, you know, I would like to be okay and like what well, I'm doing, like pursue like research and stuff like that. So like, you, you, I guess you mentioned research there, but what, what exactly, what kind of job do you get if you're not going into academia, given your field? Uh, so like right now, honestly, just like a number of things, like there's archivists and things like that, like uh, working in like local archives or, um, like doing uh, like data analysis and things like that. Cause like, that's another thing in like history and like what's like called like library science, you know, kind of like, yeah, it's like archiving and stuff like that. You know, that's a thing that's available. Um, and kind of just also like history, I do have to say like uh, for like undergrads, they do kind of prepare you for like a lot of other opportunities that are I guess non like history related, you could say. Um, and so yes, yeah, so like that there's, uh, being also in political science, you know, um, you, they give you like a ton of like internship opportunities to like do stuff in, this is an interesting opportunity, but like stuff in both like Washington DC that only does, like they do all these opportunities that you can take these internships and work for like think tanks or government employee or agencies or in Congress or um, and just all these, I mean, even non like governmental stuff, like, you know, stuff that's just in DC or in like Chicago or New York. So like, there's kind of a lot of, it's a pretty big range, I'd say. So it's, there are, it's, it's a lot of stuff that can be taken, but I'd say it's not like, you know, a barren landscape, like it's, it's a ton of things. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Like, uh, what are you, uh, what's consuming you lately? Where, where's your, uh, where's your mind at? Where are you, uh, where are you finding maybe some fun in all this? It's like the lighter uh, side of John. Lighter side, honestly. Well, we did have, uh, I was telling you about this, you know, we had our big, you know, like running, honestly, that's always just a great thing to take your time off or take, you know, just go outside and just enjoy the um, just the wind <laughs> down here in Champagne, just the cold wind. <laughs> but uh, no, like, it's honestly like that, that really like running just with uh, both of the friends and just on my own. It's always like, always felt that good to just clear my mind and stuff like that. 
Um, we have our, like I'm doing, oh, I, I, you know, for four years I've been doing the track and cross country club down here. So that's always been fun. You know, I've met a ton of great people with that. Um, and we had uh, this past weekend on Saturday, we had like a big indoor meet. So like that, that kind of took up my, you know, in between all the stuff in Ukraine and like doing research, I was like, you know, just, I had more enjoyable time, you know, just running, you know, doing that track meet and stuff like that and seeing, you know, uh, just tons of different people, you know, people uh, do other clubs like, you know, Jack Chrysler, I saw it at meet and uh, Jay Castle, it's, you know, they all came to that. So like, it was great to see them and see them compete and also just kind of see my sister who recently, or I mean, she, I, I joined the club freshman year, but she did it sophomore year, but like, you know, see her compete and all that stuff. Like, I'd say that that's that's a big thing. It's just like yeah, running and doing the club and stuff like that. Like, like it's very, like yeah, uh, um, takes your mind off of yeah <laughs> the, the horrible events of the, the world and all your work and everything. How would the meet go? Yeah, it's just, uh, it was pretty good. We are <laughs> we uh, it was fourteen years ago they started doing wholesome meet and we have won it. All 14 years since <laughs> wow. we've been able to beat all the big 10 teams and uh and kind of other colleges to come so that was pretty nice um i'd say like running wise like i felt like i had a good season i haven't been able to compete that this much this year because I've, I've just been kind of like busy with work so like you know we meets up in uh like in kind of other different colleges so i've been busy with that stuff so i kind of trained as much and like i'd kind of like i'd but more for emphasis than we had in the past this past fall in the cross country season so like the track i was kind of a little bit less kind of focused on that but it was honestly a pretty good meet i'd say so sweet uh what what did you mentioned your job what are you what are you doing uh right now it's honestly just looking for jobs that are available oh <laughs> I okay, do have, gotcha. yeah so it, it's really just not the job looking process right now and where are you looking so, at Ah, uh, it's just like a number of places. Like, I have the, my old employers from the park district, which are like, oh, you want to come back and work here? It's like, that. And it's like I kind of look for something that pays better. On that. But thanks for considering that. Um, and so, like, with that, like, there's stuff in Chicago, with like certain museums, like the Chicago um, uh, the Historical Society, and it's really like this. Chicago Historical Museum, which is very underrated museum. Like a lot of people don't go to that. It's you know, people think it? of uh, uh, it's on kind of the north side up by um uh what's it the one park shoot Lincoln Park it, uh it's no not that far it's uh shoot what is the it's like a little bit south of Lincoln Park but there's like another park that's right there it's uh, right by one of the beaches that's like like Ohio so. Street Beach. Yeah, it's kind of like, well, it's a little bit more north than that, but it's, it's like in between those areas. I don't like terrible like, directions. Montrose? I don't know. That might be further north. No, that's definitely further north. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, so like that's another one that honestly, like, yeah, people, it's, it's kind of like one of the, the few, ah, I mean, it, it supports itself, but like, you know, compared to like uh, the Field Museum or uh, Science and History, people, I think, know about it. Mm -hmm. anyway so like that's mm -hmm. one and there's kind of other like, smaller museums in chicago and there's like also like research um opportunities at like university of chicago and kind of other universities that look for like assistance for research assistance and stuff like that so like that's there and then there's like kind of you know traditional just like uh i guess ajala openings and like kind of other businesses in chicago like uh uh you know just like sales opportunities and stuff that like I like qualified or like yeah. have had experience yeah. on like working previously. And stuff like that. So it's like that's also there. John, what, what's your dream? What's like the My idea? Dream. Where are we going? Uh, are we going? I don't know. Like I, I would like to I guess be a professor. Or I, 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 that'd be fun. Like just, you know, obviously like teaching is like a that's a whole another thing of like, you no, know, and especially college teaching and stuff like that. Like it's a big, it's a huge lot of work. Or it's you know, a ton of work and everything like that. But you know, I'd like to, you know, do something like that. You know, writing a book sounds like that'd be fun and like spending the time like going through yeah, source and stuff like that, just doing all this research from what I've done now. It's been a fun process. So like, yeah, I'd say like 
something like that isn't too far off on like a dream that I have. <laughs> how do you how do you find how do you undergo a process of writing a book? That seems like the most scary thing. It's like I have to go write 500 pages of words and then re-edit it like 17 times and then come out with a book. Like, God Lord. <laughs> make make I'd say big things like make sure you have somebody else do a whole lot of like to help you out. Like a big thing that's like been for this product like, for my research now is like like I have an advisor, like a thesis advisor. And that's like working with him has been pretty great. Like, you know, they give you tips and like they're there to help you edit and everything like that. And just, you know, if you don't want to talk about like the research, you can just talk about anything else. <laughs> you know? So it's so, like, make sure you have somebody else to like, just keep you sane or something like that. <laughs> How long is your research paper going to be? Uh, probably maybe 30 pages or so. There's like around that 20, 30 pages at the very least. Minus obviously like citations and like footnotes and all that stuff. It's a pretty hefty work, I'd say. And like cover pages and stuff like that, you know. It's a lot of research, <laughs> a lot, a lot, lot of yeah. jam in there. Yeah. That's that's freaking crazy, man. I didn't like how how do you decide like what's valuable? I guess that goes back to like what we were saying earlier, yeah. is like how much of your history is it okay to erase? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's also just like the editing process, it's like, you know, like, all right, what can I cut? What, 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 what makes the story flow? Pretty much, like, that, that's another thing. That like, it's also like writing process, which, like, you know, that that helps with having somebody else work with you. Because like, you know, you might read something and that might sound good in your head, but like, if somebody else reads it out loud, that's like, ah, that doesn't really flow well. So it is, it's a lot of trial and error, I'd say. Just like going back to the drawing board and. Like, you know, redoing everything, you know, like, you know, switching this up. You know, it's a tedious process, but I feel like at the end of the, you know, once you've got your, the final project, you know, you're, you're going to be proud of yourself. You, know? you built something that was pretty, you know, you enjoy doing at the end of the day. Like, you can be proud of. That's amazing. John, what is, what's the happiest you've been in your recent, recent days, months that you can think of? Uh, it's like a moment of euphoria. Honestly, it's just like being with my friends, like <laughs> doing stuff with them. <laughs> you know, it's been pretty nice, both here in college and at like at home when you know, for winter break when I got to go back and see you know friends from high school. I got to see like you know yeah Ethan, Dirt, Dominic, <laughs> see them. Or just yeah friends here like and even like during like uh what's it, like the track week like this past week like that was just fun doing that like you know just uh you're doing something you enjoy. It's just. Yeah, you're having a good time at the end of the day. That's awesome. Man. Um, is there is there anything else you want to touch on? Uh, I mean, if you if you wanted to ask me anything else, uh, <laughs> to think of. <laughs> what's your favorite? What's your favorite? Yeah, just movie? random. What's your favorite? Or... Yeah, what's your favorite movie? Uh, oh, see, that's like. I can never like really point out this. Okay, don't movie. give me your favorite. Give me like one of the top give, five. I can give you some recommendations. Like, yeah, give me a rec. Give me a rec. Let's see. I need to get the pen and paper. It's like, I don't know. The most recent movie I saw was Kingsman or The Kingsman. And that, that was fine. That was like about World War One. I, like, I kind of found that. I found it kind of fun, kind of comedy and also uh, or like a fun action movie. But I, I, that wasn't my favorite. I'd say. Okay, um, I'll cross it out. I mean, if, if you're like, if you have nothing else to do, uh, it's not. Watch. That's not really what I'm looking for. I want something that's gonna change me. Uh let's see. I mean, if you want a nuclear war, war, uh, yeah. Doctor Strange Love. That's that's a classic. Doctor Strange uh, what? Doctor Strange Love. Love. Yeah. What is that? Uh, that is by Stanley Kubrick, who. Uh, no clockwork orange you know that oh movie? shit yeah yeah uh I'm trying to think what else uh 2001 a space Odyssey. you know and so that oh, is oh my god that that movie is weird dude yeah did so, you so this oh. Oh, man. no i don't know it's just i remember tr i tried watching that one time this was a while ago so maybe i just wasn't like aged up enough to like 
understand it, but good lord, man, it was just like 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 forty seconds of a rocket ship just like floating. You know, it's uh, supposed to be like one of the most accurate movies because he got like Carl Sagan to come in and like do a bunch of like say like oh this is how this would look like or and all that stuff. So apparently it's considered very accurate in some cases. And then that's why people think like he was consulted on like the moon landing or something like that. It's like, oh, that's why it's back this accurate. Rather than like, you know, he got the scientist to come in and be like, you know, this is probably how it'll look like. Well, yeah, so Doctor like, Strange. Okay. That that's uh so that's his movie. I think he made it in like mid or at least like 68, maybe. But it's do you know uh, Peter Sellers? Uh, I don't you know the Pink Panther? I do. So he he's the original Pink Panther, like that detective Crusoe. But he's the he's like kind of the main guy in this movie, and he plays three different characters in it. He plays the president, he plays like a British general, and then he plays uh, Doctor Strangelove, who is like this former like German. He's very much like a former like Nazi scientist who comes over to work for the Americans during the Cold War. So it's this whole like it's basically like uh, this nuclear exercise, like this. Kind of crazy general takes over. This crazy American general takes over, and orders his bombers to attack the Soviet Union. And so it's this whole process of like these guys trying to like you know, de-escalate this conflict and like you know um, try and stop this general at this point. And you have the Soviets on the other side who are like trying to shoot down the bombers. And it's 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 kind of a com- it's a pretty it's a comedy. It's a dark comedy, but it's 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 really good acting. Like Peter Sellers goes through like all these characters and does this, and then like George C. Scott, who's like this other general who helps him, is pretty great. Um, they're all just it's it's a pretty that's a kind of enjoyable movie. Both also like you know the state you know the message of like you know this is what nuclear war could lead to. So I'd throw that on the list. Okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, trying to think what else I've got. Going kind of let's see. Honestly, I always liked for I'll I'll keep I'll do this theme of like war or like you know conflict or something like that. Okay. Um, the movie nineteen seventeen. Did you ever see that? Oh, definitely saw like clips of it. Haven't watched the entire yeah. thing. I think it's like for like a World War One movie. It's pretty good. Like just showing the war through like a single soldier's eyes and like like the ending scene or like kind of the end when he has to like, oh, do this. Oh, don't 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 tell me. <laughs> Well, there's a good ending scene. There's a good thing. ending scene. Isn't that movie shot? It's like sh- it tries to look like it's, it's shot in one take. Yeah, it's it's like sort of like kind of it's set up all as like a continuous take. Jeez, I yeah. I should I should really should watch that. Okay, give me give me a give me like a an accurate or a documentary or like a like a a nonfiction. Ooh, documentary. <laughs> These are like <laughs> gotta really go through the brain to think. Of- Oh, yeah. that I was thinking. Yeah. Um, Give me some value. Give us all some value. I guess I'll do a non-war one. That's like okay. one of my favorite ones. Uh, you ever seen the movie King in the Wilderness? No. It's about the last uh, year or two of Martin Luther King's life. Or last three years, I'd say. I think. So after Selma and after it's the Voting Rights Act. And so it deals with his, him moving the civil rights movement to like Chicago. That's a huge thing. It's like in Chicago and like Mayor Daly and sort of the politics there and then also the Vietnam War. So it's it's very kind of good history of like I'd say less talked about part of his life, you know, right before his assassination. And it's really like great footage and interviews that are part of it. And it's pretty powerful, I'd say. Sweet man. Um, I guess uh give me uh give me give me something you're listening to and then we'll wrap up here. Uh, let's see, music wise or like podcast or what do you mean about listening? Wherever you want to go, man. One of each, neither of both. <clears throat> see, or here, I'll give you also, I'll give you a TV show that that's also okay. Watch. Okay. Uh, this is on Netflix. Uh, it's called Babylon Berlin and it's it's a German TV show. So it's, and I recommend listen, like watching with subtitles because like they have a dubbing that's in English, but it's not that good. You know, like if you've ever watched like Godzilla movies and they do the English dubbing, that, that, that stuff's not that good. And it, and for this, it's the same. But um, uh, it's it's a really interesting history. It's a crime drama of uh, Berlin in the 1920s, so like right before the Nazis came to power. And so it deals with this these two characters. They try and solve like a bunch of mysteries, 
author of Berlin and it's kind of it does a really good like a history person like me like I noticed and I've taken like classes about like this period I was like I'll notice things in the background or like certain historical figures who like show up for like a minute or two it's like oh it's that guy or oh it's that event or something like that um so there's I'd say that that shows and it's just like a good tv show of like I like I always like those like crime solving like mystery movie or movies and tv shows uh there's actually another one I'll recommend uh which is another crime drama which takes place in like the Gilded Age and it's called um The Alienist uh and that deals it's pretty much kind of like it's basically kind of like that show but it's an American show so you don't you don't have to worry about subtitles or like that. but uh so I'd say those two are good like kind of just crime but also like, history stuff uh and it's from music wise it's not out of YouTube recently I don't know <laughs> You're into YouTube, what you say? Uh, YouTube, you know. Oh, YouTube. Yeah, it was the anniversary a few weeks ago of Bloody Sunday, so I was listening to their of stuff what? on that. Uh, Bloody Sunday. Oh, really? It was uh, 15th anniversary a few weeks ago, so I was listening to their stuff on that, and then, you know, they're just they're just one of my favorite bands, so I was, I was just listening to them. Same with my dad. That's, that's also my dad, yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome, dude. That's awesome, bro. Um, sweet. I guess give us a podcast, man. We are getting the John Rex. Ooh, let's see. Um, honestly, a really good one I've been listening to recently is uh, "Unclear and Present Danger." It's uh, by these two guys who like go or they're looking at like a bunch of uh, like the movies of the '90s that are like Cold War or like post Cold War movies that are like kind of like the Tom Clancy movies, but also just like. They call them like they jokingly call it like dad movies, like dad movies that you're like your your like fifty year old dad will like put on like on a Saturday and like and so they're like doing like kind of a interesting like kind of like political and historical analysis of these movies, like what they say about the period and stuff like that. So I, I and I always like those like kind of plenty books and novels or, or like movies and video games. So like I, I was interested in the podcast and so like it, it's and they're pretty funny. I'd say like listening to talk about so awesome, man. Well, it's it's been absolutely wonderful to have you on, John. Um, yeah. It's a uh, I'm glad you uh you didn't necessarily like you didn't reach out, but you reached out to a person that was also on the podcast, and we we made it happen. Yeah. <laughs> so so that's awesome, man. Yeah. If you uh, want to record that episode here and, and talk yeah. about it. He, he, what Ethan's got to say. Well, he's got stuff I'll... to say. He's got stuff to say. It's a uh, he's the, always great to the oil. He's I think Healy's gonna come back on after he uh, does a little stint in the oil industry, and you are you're He's welcome. Talking oil today with us. Oh yeah, <laughs> like that. Yeah, with me and Dominic. <laughs> That's fun. That's fun. Yeah, but you are you are welcome to come on anytime, man. But uh, if you ever got anything to say, but it is okay. it's been awesome, bro. Um, That's awesome. What? It's been so much fun. Yeah. Oh, it's awesome. great to see What's, you. You know, yeah, I, uh, I feel like I you know I see. You. You know, when I'm back in Glen Ellen and stuff like that, but yeah, yeah, just so if we if we link up at the same time, yeah. But it's been great, man. Thanks for catching up. I said it was the last time you were down in Champaign for uh, you ran that one meet that we had. Oh, I did. Oh, yeah, that was always nice seeing you. That one. I think I'm gonna be back down in Champaign in um in oh not this weekend but next weekend for because mm-hmm. Glumbard West. Oh, probably basketball, right? in the basketball championship yeah. so i was like fuck it let's go yeah. down so that should be pretty fun we could link up then that'd be fun are you gonna go to the yeah. game uh i think i actually might be at the big 10 tournament so that's that week also and the oh. one basketball is big right also that's in indiana that indiana oh wow yeah the, the boys to indiana it's either that or i usually go back so that's also the st patrick's day parade in chicago is that saturday Oh my God! That's, that's a like, big it, Saturday, fellas. Either I'm either going to that or we're going back up to to do that stuff. So, so a lot going on. Plus, like we have spring break that week, so. Oh, you do. Yeah, it, we, starts, it starts that, that it starts that weekend in the Echo. So. Oh, that's week. that's pretty nice. That's a that's a good that's a good start there. You got any plans? Uh I'm going skiing with a few friends and Mary Beth. Where? Yeah. Uh, Salt Lake City. Oh, I've only shit. ever been. I've only ever been cross country skiing, and that's just literally been like around Glen Ellen. Like this past winter, like when we had all that snow, I went and like a few years when like when we really get snow in Glen Ellen, like I've done it, but I've never done like downhill and all that stuff. So 
it should be interesting that'll be a shocker that'll be fun bro like all my cousins and everybody else have done that i've just never done it the most it's been it's been like yeah i'm like the prairie path just like going on the skis and that's it. <laughs> no yeah it'll be a big difference it'll be big and utah is a pretty nice place to go skiing is this what i hear um mm-hmm. i got a few friends out there ethan separate's out there where you can link up. Yeah. i don't know if you you still talk to him but uh it was cool watching him in the Olympics. That was pretty nice to see him. Yeah. Right? That's pretty yeah. nice. Though. He's a medalist. He's an Olympic medalist. We got our own, our very own Olympic medalist. <laughs> Let's go get some some gold, you know? Yeah. 